Oh hey, I didn't see you there. With the advent of technology, we've really reached an age where internet memes have become all the rage. But this is bandwagon, so we're gonna narrow it down to meme music. And when it comes to meme music, you have a lot of funny songs out there like Caramel Dancer, um, You Were Posted in the Wrong Neighborhood, and I think more recently Chug Chug With You. But most of these meme songs, they're not meant to be funny. In fact, they're made out of a genuine passion for music. So what we're gonna dive into today is, is it possible for us to appreciate these meme songs as normal songs? Or will they just forever remain as memes? So let's talk about the methodology. We're gonna take five meme songs that went viral in the past decade, we're gonna listen to them on loop and just see how long it takes for me to appreciate them unironically at the end of the day. I also interviewed Alex Griffin, who researches the political economy of memes and music at the University of Melbourne, as well as Nick Canovas from Mike the Snare, a YouTube channel that dives deep into discussions about music. And what I basically did was just ask them about, you know, what the differences are between discovering music from memes compared to more traditional memes. Second time of the day! Second time of the day! Oh! But before we move on, let's settle an age-old question that's been burning at the back of our minds. What does it even mean to unironically appreciate a meme song? Like, sure, we've all bobbed to a meme song ironically before in our lives, but where's that point of transition from thinking, ha, I'll never actually like this, to, um, oh, oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> and learn how to hide your feelings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you determine that? I don't think it's something you can do. And let me tell you, my dude, that you are absolutely right. It's not something I can measure accurately. It's not something I'm conscious of because the moment I realise that I'm genuinely appreciating a meme song, it's way too late, right? The deed is done. The moment is over. I can't capture that moment again. But you know, for the purposes of this video, we're just going to equate that to the time taken for me to come up with a decent song review. Because you know, that's the moment I'm taking a song seriously. That's the moment I'm actually paying attention to what goes on in the song. And I'm not going to force myself to come up with a song review. If I can't think of anything, I'm just not going to say anything. So that's that. So I spent the last evening listening to these meme songs and we originally planned to film it on the day itself. But uh, I'm going to be honest with you, my brain was completely fried after listening to all of them on loop. Like I couldn't function at all. <laughs> and you're about to see why. First one up is Bakamitai, the song that promoted Yakuza better than Sega ever could. And if you still don't know what Yakuza is, Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Basically, it's a video game about the Japanese mafia. And Bakamitai exists in this game as a song that you can sing. And by sing, I mean press buttons on the PS4 too, while playing its karaoke mini game. <laughs> It's a game about a Japanese mafia and it has a karaoke mini game. I hope that gives you an idea of just how incredible this entire franchise is. This song was so powerful, right? That it spawned this whirlwind of memes that was great in not just number, but also variety. You have deep fake memes of people lip syncing to the chorus. You have Keanu Reeves crying and apologizing while Baka Mitai plays in the background. And you also have an emotional Hatsune Miku cover. And we all know that the moment you've made it to the meme scene is the moment your song gets a Hatsune 
Nico cover. But the source material was the best part about this whole thing, because nothing touches the human heart more than an anime himbo getting drunk while crooning about his lost love, am I right? So let's just check it out! I haven't listened to Bakamita in a long time, and I'm pretty excited to see what this song has in store for me. You know, after listening to this song, I feel like I've forgotten how good this song actually sounded. Because man, it sounds heckin' good! Like you have this soaring string arrangement over these layers of chord progression and it just sounds so beautiful and intensely sentimental. And that harmonica? That harmonica though! Like it has no reason to sound this good. Maybe the production can sound a bit cheesy, but I don't think it makes the song sound any less iconic. I think Bata Mitai, you know, wholly commits to that era that the game is set in and it really nails that sort of vintage vibe that the song is clearly going for. I think this song is depressing in the most glorious way possible and I am living for it! Like, Sega, your taste in music? It's like... It's fire! It's, it's fire, bro! Like, I have no words. This is so good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's cut this. And I think, in general, there's quite a number of meme songs that started out as soundtracks. And when it comes to why, I think Alex puts it really well. A successful soundtrack is one that creates an oral vocabulary for an entire world. What that means is that the moment you hear a soundtrack, you're able to immediately link it back to where it came from. And that includes the visual scenery, as well as the atmosphere and the vibe. And that's really what makes a good meme, right? The fact that it's so evocative, the fact that it's so delightfully sensual, the fact that it's so... Sexy. <laughs> Careless Whisper, the national anthem of sexy. With this song, anything could be made sexy in just three easy steps. Step one, do anything. Step two, play Careless Whisper. And step three, there's no step three, you're already sexy. This song was released all the way back in 1984 to insane success. Like I'm talking about a chart-topping single in almost 25 countries that sold 6 million copies worldwide. It's a sexy song with a sex riff that sold 6 million copies! It doesn't get any more iconic than this man. But if I were to be completely honest with you, aside from the saxophone riff, I have absolutely no idea about what the rest of the song sounds like. So I'm just gonna give it a few listens and see what happens. So, Terrace Whisper. This one actually didn't take really long because after listening to that sex with, right, the rest of the song just doesn't really live up to the hype. Like, George Michael's voice is perfectly fine and I did really like the bridge. But after listening to the entire song, I still feel that the saxophone riff is the part that's doing most of the work here. Now that I'm listening to the riff in context, right, it doesn't actually sound all that sexy. It just sounds really sad. Which I guess is, you know, the point, right? Since this song is about the regret you feel after cheating on your lover. You know, actually, now that I think about it, right? I read most of the meme songs out there. Okay, maybe not most, just like, you know, a lot of the meme songs out there. Aren't they actually really sad? Like, you have like, Careless Whisper, you have like, Baka Mitai. You have a bunch of other meme songs that I can't really remember at the moment. Is this a moment where I'm supposed to find out that we've been listening to meme songs as a coping mechanism all this time? <laughs> but like, back to the song, right? I think the beat at the end was kind of unusual, so it sort of put me off a bit. But other than that, the song is alright. I actually don't mind it existing in my playlist. So the thing about Careless Whisper is that it's one of those hit songs from the early decades that just had to blow up again as a meme song when the internet culture became a thing. And there are other old songs like it as well. One example might be that, you know, A Thousand Miles by Vanessa Carlton, where the structure of it, the memes, it's like that 15 second kind of, you know, you know what's coming. It's about how well known the song already is and how nostalgia plays into that, but it still has to be connected to something that's funny and connects with people immediately. You know, at this point, we've already reviewed a couple of meme songs, but what about an entire meme genre? That's right, buddy. Up next, we have... We, we have... Uh... 
yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> so I cannot talk about meme music without talking about Vaporwave, right? But what even is Vaporwave? The way I see it, Vaporwave is like deja vu the genre, right? Like you have this sampling of retro music and then you add effects to it to give it that sort of timber that reminds us of specific times and places. Point is, if you know about Vaporwave, Lisa Frank 420, no it's probably how you got to know about this entire genre in the first place. Everything about this track really played a huge part in influencing Vaporwave as a whole and that includes its aesthetic. Like have you seen the album cover? You have the Greek statue, the colour palette, right? The great um, Macintosh. <laughs> just, just Macintosh. Um, we're not sponsored, by the way, just, just putting that out there. You know, Vaporwave is often perceived as a meme genre, but in a lot of ways, it's actually one of the first genres that was born on the internet. The whole visual style of Vaporwave, that whole 80s throwback with the iconography and the you know color schemes, I think was a massive part of its spread too, because there was that audio component, but also the visual component that people could, you know, latch onto in their minds. And the more I thought about it too, there was also this, again, I'm not sure if this would be the right word, but faceless quality to Vaporwave, because a lot of the people who made it, uh, you know, Macintosh Plus, uh, Blank Banshee, they're often thought of as just kind of these blank personas. And a lot of their music was given away for free, or at least you could find it very easily online without having to pay anything. So in many ways, Vaporwave is the musical manifestation of memes. You have these audiovisual references to shared memories, with a focus on music rather than the creators. So how good does it actually sound? Oh my god, this song man. Like, did you know that it's 7 minutes long? Cause like, I sure did not when I, I first searched the song up. And now that I've listened to it right, it actually didn't really feel like 7 minutes. I guess it's like an arrangement thing. Like, every second actually sounded like necessary in order to make the song feel complete. That's it, right? This song doesn't really do anything for me beyond that. Like, this song is basically the musical equivalent of zoning out, right? And it sounds surprisingly empty, especially considering what's going on in this track. I guess that's the vibes it's going for. The vibes are there. The vibes are strong. But it's just not what I vibe with, if you know what I mean. As someone who's really familiar with genres like Vaporwave and related genres like Future Funk, I personally think that Vaporwave is really at its best when it's able to completely transform a song into something completely different. So if you're looking for good Vaporwave, I'd suggest other artists like Sing Pepsi or like Young Bay. They have like really good Vaporwave albums that I would highly recommend you to check out. So, the solo shot. We start off 20. <laughs> You know, just as Vaporwave breathed new life into old songs with the power of sampling, sometimes memes can also cause obscure gems that you've never even heard of to blow up into the mainstream. And I'm talking about songs like... was originally released as a theme song for this Taiwanese drama in 1984. You know, if I'm gonna be honest with you, I was really struck when I heard about this song blowing up on TikTok. So it all started with the egghead guy, right? He sang the Shui Hua Piao Piao and people laughed and people went to search up the original song to see what the heck it was all about, right? And I think that was really the moment when this song became this sort of um, ironic Asian anthem. <laughs> You know, I actually haven't checked out this song in forever. Like, even when this blew up on TikTok as a meme, right? I only heard that one soundbite, which was the chorus. So, let's give it a proper listen. It's Shui Hua Piao Piao Tai. Something that I really love about Asian languages is that they're really poetic and beautiful. And I think Yi Jianmei really understands the assignment. Because the lyricism is just God here. Like, can I just like search this out for you real quick? Yeah! You have lyrics like The snow falls and the north wind blows The world is vast and boundless A cut of plum blossom stands proudly in the snow Its perfume is only for one person like bars Bars, my dude! So to give this some context, right? Romance portrayed in Mandel Pop in general It's always been done in a really grand kind of way I'm talking about things like Oh girl, let us like swear our eternal love to each other at the mountains by the sea You know, the aesthetics of love in general is just a really big part of this genre And everything has to be linked to the natural environment in some kind of way Because, you know, the environment's really sexy The environment's really hot And it's only gonna get even hotter from here <laughs> so, this is a certified bot for me. I like it. I like it a lot. The thing about this song, right, is that every Chinese parent and subsequently their kids knows about this song. And prior to this whole TikTok thing, 
nobody else. So the fact that this song was able to reach such a broad international audience from what was basically out of nowhere is honestly quite astounding. You're being recommended content based on the fact that you're a member of a particular audience, you listen to a particular radio station. But what we're seeing here is an entirely different type of distribution, I would say, because you are now experiencing music not just being as a commodity being pushed to you, but something you can instantly use, something you can join in with, something you can participate, uh, share, um, do the hashtag challenge, push to your friends in a far more organic way. And now, we're going to take on Why are we still here? Perhaps one of the greatest meme songs of the 2010s and definitely my greatest challenge yet. <laughs> Suffer. Oh my god, this, this is gonna be... Uh... Oh, it's, it's Hotline Bling. I don't want to talk about Hotline Bling, but let's clap anyways. Let's, let's clap this... Let's clap the slate. Yeah, it's Hotline Bling. <laughs> <laughs> Made by Drake, released in 2015, which is like six years ago. Oh my god, it was six years ago. But I guess trauma keeps the memory alive, right? So something special about this song really is that the memes came almost immediately after the song's release. And it wasn't really as much about the song as it was about the video itself. Like you have um, Drake playing tennis, Drake learning the ways of the force. You have um, Drake catching them all. Oh yeah, and this is also a thing? Did you know it was called Drake posting? Because I did it. I just knew it as the last thing I wanted to see on my cell phone late nights when I needed some memes. Anyway, enough talk, let's just give this a listen. So you might have noticed that the length of the recording is actually less than the actual length of the song. And that's because I, I didn't finish it. I, I couldn't finish it. I wrote the proposal for this. Why? You know, like, like, some, like sometimes I like, ask myself, like, why even do certain things in the first place? And like, this is, this is one of those moments. But that doesn't mean I have nothing to say. To be fair, the lyrics are actually pretty well written. You have rhythms like ever since I left the city, you, which you know is pretty easy for people to groove into, and the production is good. It's catchy. It's innovative for its time. And I would have added Hotline Bang to my playlist if. It wasn't also the most overplayed song of 2015. Like I'm not gonna lie to you and say that oh you know after years of actively avoiding this song because 2015 had too much drink for me to handle, Hotline Bling actually sounds pretty refreshing now because it doesn't. Like it's not bad. It's not bad but it just gives me supreme war flashbacks to you know that time where I had to scroll through drink meme after drink meme. Like it used to be funny but now I just pretty Hotline Bling just went way too hard in 2015, I suppose. <sighs> but in the end, was I able to take all of these meme songs seriously? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, how else was I supposed to come up with those song reviews, right? Even for Hotline Bling, the fact that I even care enough about it to give it a bad review is a sign that I am taking it seriously enough. And, you know, all of this aside, let me just take this time to share with you a personal story of mine. So there's this band called Gorillas, but I've never heard about them until I've watched that one Nagito edit. It's this fan animation that's like 30 seconds long, and frankly, it's the best 30 seconds I've ever experienced in my entire life. Like the animation is so well made. You have all of these Dangarumba characters like, like standing around in this class trial, right? And then Nagito just goes, Nature's corrupted, and factories far away. And then Hajime is like holding his hand hands up like here we go again and then it's just this flurry of incredibly smooth animation of like um the CG stills from the game and the characters look alive and Nagito looks alive like oh my god so I was like this song sounds really good and it's rhinestone eyes by gorillas so I searched it up and fast forward to now and I'm a gorillas convert just because I got to know about a song through a meme doesn't mean that I'm unable to genuinely appreciate it for what it is. So why do we see so much gatekeeping of who gets to enjoy these songs? You know, um, comments like these. I think this can happen really whenever, you know, an in-group, if you will, has a song or knows a song, and then a larger outside group comes, finds that song, 
and then appropriates it in new ways. I think this can be an issue when the outside group takes the song or elements from it without understanding, respecting, or credited those involved, especially if that group happens to be uh, marginalized. I think it's really important yeah, to not view there being a hierarchy of the right way to hear music or there being a, a wrong sort of distribution channel to experience through, but the fact that all of this sound um, has the potential for different kinds of significance and different kinds of signification. If it can be maimed, that means that there's something rich within the song, there's something essential to it that can activate sort of communal experiences. And I think that that's, you know, sort of a beautiful thing. The songs that I like and the artists that I like, having a higher platform and having more opportunities to do what they love, always for it, always for it. In the end, yes, it is possible for you to genuinely appreciate meme songs, even if they will forever remain as memes, right? Because the memes are part of your personal appreciation of these songs. Finding a song by yourself or through a meme, it doesn't make your personal appreciation of the song better or worse, more or less sincere, right? Like, it's just a different kind of appreciation that is just as valid. So yeah, I don't really care about how you got here, but do you like this song? That's what I want to hear. Oh! Oh my god! I'm on a roll today! I'm gonna put this part to this part because this door cannot close for some reason and I just want it to be closed, okay? We have a pair of scissors here right now. Stick, stick. It's done! The deed is done! I have secured a door. And that is my greatest accomplishment of the day.